Church music should be vibrant and uplifting and also soul-searching and meditative. That was, that was a truly a blessing. Uh, let me invite you now to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. And uh, before I get into it, let me just uh, announce this. If, uh, if you don't know, Pastor Ted and Phyllis Conover, it's their last Sunday with us until they come again in the fall. Make sure you say goodbye. They, they do so much around here. Um, give them a, a, a farewell until we meet again in the fall. And then on a more serious note, uh, Don and Kathleen Hale's granddaughter, Louisa, is going to have major heart surgery tomorrow. Uh, Kathleen is up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, she's less than a year old. Is that correct, Don? Five months. She's on five months, yes. So um, let's be in prayer for her. In fact, I'm going to pray for that right now, and then we'll get into our text this morning, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you as a needy people. We know that you are the great physician. You've healed uh, miraculously before. I've, I've, I've been involved in prayer with people who doctors can't explain how the cancer went away, how the ailment just disappeared. Lord, you are the great physician, so we ask for the surgery for Louisa tomorrow that uh, you give the doctor skill, wisdom, skill in, in the operation You would meet the need, comfort the mom and the grandparents and the parents. Lord, we ask that uh, you just intervene there and help that to go smoothly. Uh, I believe it's heart surgery, Lord. We pray that you would give that child a healthy heart and that it would go well. And for us today, spiritually, open our hearts and minds that we might have a spiritually healthy heart. Uh, give us your truth, enlighten our minds, and stir our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we are in our Bibles, Luke chapter 9, caring and sharing like Jesus. You know, uh, George Mueller was born into a German tax collector's family. He was often in trouble. He learned early to steal and to gamble and to drink. As a teenager, he learned how to stay in expensive hotels and then sneak out without paying the bill. But at length, he was caught and jailed, and prison did him little good, for upon his release, he continued his crime spree until Saturday night in 1825, he met Jesus Christ and bowed the knee. Mueller married and settled down in Bristol, England, growing daily in faith and developing a burden for the homeless children running wild and ragged through the streets. At a public meeting in Bristol, England, on December 9, 1835, he presented a plan for an orphanage. Several contributions came in. Mueller rented 6 Wilson Street, and on April 11, 1836, the doors of the orphanage opened. Twenty-six children were immediately taken in. A second house soon opened, and then a third. From the beginning, Mueller refused to ask for funds or even speak of the ministry's financial needs. He believed in praying earnestly and trusting the Lord to provide. And the Lord did provide, though sometimes at the last moment. The best-known story involves a morning when the plates and the bowls and the cups were set on the tables, but there was no food or milk. The children sat waiting for breakfast while Mueller led in prayer for their daily bread. A knock sounded at the door. It was the baker. Mr. Mueller, he said, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you needed to have some bread for breakfast, so I got up at 2 a.m. and baked some fresh bread. A second knock sounded. The milkman had broken down right in front of the orphanage, and he wanted to give the children his milk so he could empty his wagon and repair it. Such stories became the norm for Mueller's work. During the course of his 93 years, Mueller housed more than 10,000 orphans, prayed in millions of dollars, traveled to scores of countries preaching the gospel, and recorded 50,000 answers to prayer. George Mueller learned how to care and how to share, like Jesus. And Jesus will teach his disciples that very same lesson in our text this morning. So Luke chapter 9, let's look at verses 10 to 17. Luke 9, verse 10. And the apostles, when they were returned, told him all that they had done. Okay, if you don't remember, last week he sent them out two by two, gave them power 
and authority over demons and, and disease. And so now they're coming back to give a report. They told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. And the people, when they knew it, followed him, and he received them, and spake unto them of the kingdom of God, and healed them that had need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the towns and country round about, and lodge and get victuals. For we are here in a desert place. But he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said, We have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down by fifties in a company. And they did so, and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and brake and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat. And they were all filled, and there was taken up of fragments that remained to them twelve baskets. So here we see Jesus caring and sharing. They had just come back from a preaching tour. He had disseminated twelve by two, six, six teams of two, to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to cast out demons, to heal diseases. They had come back. They are no doubt tired of ministry. He, he cared enough to know how they were doing. He listened to their report. And as verse 10 says, you know, they told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place, some sealed or quiet, secluded, private area belonging to the city of Bethsaida. This was out of Herod, the Tetrarch's domain, his rule. John the Baptist had just been killed not too long ago. In fact, Jesus will get that news, or if he hadn't gotten it already here. But he hears this report of a successful ministry, okay? An example to us, too. Hey, listen, we should care about what people are doing. Friends care. Believers, the family of God, the community of faith, you should care about one another and how things are going in life. But they give him this glowing report, and he, he suggests, he leads them, look, you guys have been out for a long time. You've been ministering. Let's go to a quiet place. Let's get settled. Let's rest. Let's get renewed, refreshed. Because that preaching and healing tour had been demanding. They needed time for physical and spiritual renewal. And another lesson for us, those people who work with people, you have to be intentional about setting aside time for spiritual renewal, especially those who work in ministry. But that's true of every helping profession. To be busy with ministry is a good thing. To be busy without wisdom is a bad thing. You know, busy ministry suggests a life of meaning and pur purpose and spiritual zeal. But if we fail to make time for reflection, for renewal, our souls begin to run on empty. And if our souls run on empty for too long, if it's, a, if it's allowed to continue, we'll, we'll start to backslide. We'll, we'll go put our Christian life in reverse. And the inevitable result of not getting spiritually renewed and refreshed is continued backsliding, and continued backsliding will lead to a crash and burn or a slow leak that just leaves you on the side of the road. And if you allow that to happen... You give an occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. They will say, see, he's no better than us, and neither is his God. So you continually have to make, be intentional about spiritual renewal. Part of that is, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. You're here. You come. You hear the word of God. It stirs you up. It encourages you. It comforts you. And then it rebukes you. Make time for spiritual renewal. The Shulamite woman, I've never quoted a Song of Solomon verse, but the, the, the Shulamite woman in Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 6 says this, They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. Other people, other things were controlling her schedule, her energy, and her time, and she neglected her own vineyard. Okay? Let's not let that happen with us, with me and you and our Christian walk. 
We need to set aside time and get that spiritual renewal, whether it's day by day in the morning, at night, whenever it is. Set aside time metaphorically here and practically to spend time in spiritual renewal. This is a good example for us. This is a good example for Christian workers to imitate. But when we do set aside some time, what should we ask of ourselves? Let me just give you a couple things that you should ask, or a few things that you should ask in regards to renewing a relationship with God, renewing your spiritual focus. Number one, ask this question, God, how am I doing spiritually? In fact, you can ask that of your friend. That'll help. How am I doing spiritually? Is my faith a living and a vibrant faith, or is it stagnant? Do people look at it and turn away, or do they look at it and draw close? Because they want what you have. How is your spiritual walk? How are you doing spiritually? Ask yourself that and ask God to help you to see. Number two, what advantage have you taken of means of grace? What do I mean by that? How do we renew our souls? How do we keep spiritual focus? One, worship God consistently, regular basis, which you do. You're here. Uh, scripture memory. I find no other spiritual discipline that will help you so much as Scripture memory. You plan it here, you treasure it here, and then the Holy Spirit comes, stirs it up, brings it out, you speak the word, and you do it, and God blesses. Are you memorizing Scripture? Are you involved in family prayers, personal prayer? Do you read the Bible? You don't have to read a chapter a day, you just read a, a section a day. Whatever it does to renew your spiritual soul and health. Thirdly, what opportunities do you have for service and witness? Did you take them? If the opportunity is there, perhaps it's time. Fourthly, what temptations have you faced and how did you overcome? Okay, you ask questions like this to yourself, to your close Christian friends. It'll help you to maintain a forward walk continuing to walk with God. Take time for reflection and refreshment. Ask God to help you to be more faithful. And so this is what Jesus was doing with his, his 12. Okay, when, when, you know, I like quiet time. I like people. I love people. I also like quiet time. I love being alone too. <laughs> so I, I, I get both, right? But Here is Jesus taking his disciples to a quiet place, secluded, away from the crowd. But the crowd comes anyway. Okay? When you are busy, okay, they're trying to get some rest. You want some me time, is what we call it today. We want some downtime. We want some me time. And guess what? This me time evaporates very quickly. Okay, with me and perhaps with you, you get a little bit snippy and short. And you, know, you, you know, short bursts of angry speech, loaded. <laughs> what? What do you want? You know? But you don't see that with Jesus here. He doesn't turn him away. He doesn't, get, he doesn't angrily protect his quiet time. There's no doubt he made other quiet time at a different time and location, as we will see in John chapter 6, as we read during the scripture reading. But let's look back down again, verse 11 here. And the people, when they knew it, followed him, and and he received them. He didn't turn them away. He said, look, I need my rest. He didn't turn them away. What does it mean? The scarcity of food here after these people that he has now received, 5,000 men at least. This was during um, perhaps a large portion of this crowd was not only those who heard of his miracles, but also a large Passover pilgrim crowd on their way south. So here is at least 5,000 men, and if you you include a spouse and a child, perhaps anywhere between 10 to 15,000 people total. And they're demanding of him, of his time, of his healing. And it says there in verse 11, And he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that that had need of healing. So we have this scarcity of food driving people and this curiosity for miracles and need for healing driving people. And people find out 
when people, practically speaking, when you have people making a withdrawal from your emotional bank account in your time, do you see them as pests go away, or do you see them as an opportunity to serve people and God, to love God and people? Ask yourself that question, because it is a challenge. Jesus had compassion on them, and he ministered to them. He receives them. He, t- he takes them in. He, he's not stoic. He's not emotionally distant. He's not standoffish, as we often get, especially around needy people. He was close. He was caring. He's willing to share. He didn't turn them away. He was gentle. He was condescending. He, he stooped down. His ear was always ready to hear, his hand was always ready to work, and his tongue was always ready to teach. That's an example that we have. In fact, John 6, 37, in that same context, he says, He that comes to me, I won't cast out. Jesus is teaching here not by proposition or command. He is teaching by example here. Let me remind you about the brevity of life, how short it is. In fact, I was speaking to someone recently, you know, the longer you live, the faster the time goes by. So I speak to young and old alike here. The time and the material things of life are a gift from God. And they are also tools that you can use. As a gift, they should be enjoyed. You should enjoy the time and the material things that God has given you. Enjoy them. Let them increase your happiness. But as tools, they should be used, they should be invested in eternity. Listen to Ecclesiastes 5.18. It says this about life and material things. He says, Behold that which I have seen. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he's taken under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. So, Your life, your time, the good things that you have, they're a gift from God. Enjoy them. Don't feel guilty about enjoying them. Don't don't feel guilty about being wealthy. Okay? It is a gift from God. However, make sure you have the right perspective. 1 Timothy 6, 17. The Apostle Paul, speaking to Pastor Timothy, he says this. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust uncertain riches, but in the living God. Who hath giveth us all things richly, I'm, I'm sorry, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So the good things, enjoy them, but don't trust in them. Don't get proud about them. Remember, those are things of this world. You will not take it with you. They are gifts to be enjoyed. But the danger is this. I read I heard this on the radio. Uh, I don't know, a few months ago, and I just thought it was sad. A couple retired in the Florida area. They spent most of their days collecting shells. Okay? I like collecting shells. My, 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 my kids collect shells, but we don't do it eight hours a day. Okay? Enjoy the life, but have it in the right priority. It's a waste of life if you collect shells five, eight hours a day. Okay? Don't waste your life and the gift that God has given in time and resources. But use that time. Use those resources. Listen to how Jesus explains how you should use your resources and time. The parable of the unjust manager from Luke chapter 9, verses 12. We'll spend more time on that in a few few months here. But he says this short little, little quip about how you should handle mammon, your resources, your money, your time. He says, and I say unto you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Okay, use the material things in life for people, for relationships. That when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting homes. This is from the New King James, okay? He who is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you what is your own? So in a nutshell here, Jesus is teaching true wealth and prosperity are not the material things of life. 
True wealth and prosperity is your ability to minister the word of God to those two things that will last forever. The things that will last forever is not your house or your home or your car. Those things will rust and decay and they'll belong to somebody else. The true riches in life are God's words ministered. This is what he's saying. True riches is this, faithfulness and stewardship of this to the souls of men. Because the souls of men last forever too. So true riches should be dedicated time and resources to the ministering of the word of God to the souls of men. That's what Jesus did here. Did he just feed them and did he just heal them? You'll see there it says that he received them. He, he, he welcomed them. He didn't turn them away. And he also preached unto them the kingdom of God. True wealth is the truth about the kingdom of God and putting it out there for the souls of men. So here's the kingdom of God. He preaches it. Kingdom of God is, wor- is for all those who will believe. Real quickly, the subject of the kingdom of God here. In order to have a kingdom, you have to have a king, you have to have a subject, and you have to have a reign or a rule. The king is the one that's been promised. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Hamashiach, the, the, the Messiah, the king. Here he is. The kingdom of God is present because the king is now present. And then, in order for you to be a subject in that kingdom, what do you do? Repentance and faith. Jesus said, blessed are those, blessed are the, uh, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You bow the knee and enter into that narrow way to become a subject of the kingdom. And then how does a king rule? So you have the the king, the subject, and the reign. A king reigns by his word, his edict. Those are the true riches, ministering the kingdom of God and his word. So Jesus healed them that needed healing, and then we see in verse 12 there, you know, here are these tired apostles, (laughs) send them away. Okay, whatever people work that you do, whether you're, you know, a cashier, a grocer, a teacher, sometimes you get to that point, right? Send them away because I don't have it anymore. I have nothing to give. And that's the point where their apostles are right now. They're there. Send them away. At this point in time, they had not caught the compassion of Christ. They didn't have the burden that Jesus had for the multitudes. But one day they would. And one day they will. But they forgot at this time the unlimited resources that they had in the person of Jesus Christ. And so what does Jesus do? He kind of passes the baton, you know, that service mantle. You give him something to eat. You know, they say, send him away. We don't have the food. We don't, look, there's no 7-Elevens around here. They can't go through a drive through Send them away. He says, you give him something to eat. I, I would have laughed right there. Really? Seriously? Us, give them something to eat. There's over 15,000 people in the desert right now or in a deserted place, a secluded place right now. But according to John, in the scripture reading, he asked them, knowing what he would do. Here's Jesus, again, teaching. Look, you got to come to a point you realize you have nothing to give. But Jesus has it to give. You're just a channel, a conduit from above through you to them. That's what they're learning here. Jesus would not ask you to do something that you and he couldn't do together. Don't focus on your lack, but rather focus on God's abundance. Their focus was no money, no food. Jesus first asked Philip in John, in in John 6, 6, look, how much money do we need to buy this? So, the financial aspects thrown out there. We don't, we don't have the money. And then, another disciple comes and says, look, Andrew says, look, here's a boy with five loaves and two fish. Oh, great, we just got to feed 15,000 people with this. <laughs> How's that going to happen? Send them away. But here, listen, in the crisis hours of life, When you think that your resources are low and your responsibilities are great, it is good to remember this. Jesus knows what he's going to do. He already knew what was going to happen. Okay, one of his names, 
Old Testament, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord sees. Abraham on Mount Moriah about to sacrifice his son. God provides a ram in the thicket to die in the place of his son. And he names the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will see. The Lord will see to it. The Lord sees ahead. God is providential. God exercises providence. He sees your need way down the road, and he sent the answer already. He sees to it, and he provides. And so we see here an example here. Before we ask God to do the impossible, let's start with the possible. Okay? We've done the math. We don't got the money. We got five loaves and two fishes. Here, God, this is everything we got. That's where we need to get to. And then what happens? Jesus gets things in order. He systematizes the crowd. Have them sit down. They're not a faceless crowd. Have them sit down in 50s. Okay, these are real live people with real needs. He cared for them. Look, I don't want any disorder. I don't want any pushing or shoving. Have them sit down. 5,000 men plus women and children. And now we see in verses 15 to 17 what happens. He completes the miracle here. He takes the five, five loaves, two fish, looks up into heaven, and, and then begins to break the bread. Okay, here's pictures of the Lord's Supper. Here's a picture of, this, uh, of communion. Okay, he is enough for all who come by faith. We have the surplus of food. He looks up into heaven. He, he, he blessed it. He broke it. And he kept on doing it. They would go away with baskets. They'd come back. And he just kept doing it. Kept breaking bread. Kept uh, uh, breaking up the fish. They, they came back. He filled it. They came back. He filled it. He kept on breaking bread. He multiplied it. They distributed it. Here's the picture. Jesus is the producer. His, his people, his disciples are the distributors. He... When he says, you give them to eat, you know what that is? That's a proto-gospel. Okay, it's kind of a, a picture of the Great Commission. You give them something to eat. And what will you give them to eat? The next chapter, or the next few words of John 6, after he does this miracle, during a festival, you know what he says? I am the bread of life. He that comes to me will never hunger. He that believes in me will never thirst. They were getting a lesson on his identity of who he is. Everybody was served and satisfied. There was plenty of food. There were leftovers. In fact, it says, gather up the fragments that remain. He doesn't like waste. How many of you get irked when someone leaves a light on when they, and they leave the house? I go through, hey, let's not waste anything, all right? No one's going to enjoy the light. Turn it off if you're not using it. And, uh, yeah, I'm a grouch that way at times. But um, here, God cares about syst- systematic order. Here is, here's what they were learning. This miracle was more, more than an act of caring and sharing, even though that was important. It was also a sign of who Jesus is, the Messiahship, his gracious provision, his identity, his creative power. Here is one who can take, bring light from darkness. Here is one who can create order out of disorder. Here is one who can make strength out of weakness. Here is one who can bring joy out of sorrow. And here is one who can feed the multitudes until they're satisfied. And again, Jesus would say, I am the bread of life. Christ crucified is the bread of life. The heart of man will never be satisfied with the things of this world, the material things. Because those things are always empty and they'll always leave you dissatisfied. He is the one who said, I'm the bread of life and he who believes in me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. He's the only one that will satisfy. So as I close here, let's remind ourselves of this, some simple application, simple truth here. Get away from the busyness of life. Ask God how you're walking, your spiritual walk right now. Have compassion 
on the needy. Share with them physical need with the priority of ministering the Word of God to them. Thirdly, how do you, over, how do you, how do you respond when, when there is overwhelming need? Are you like the disciples? Send them away. Send it away. Or are you like Philip? Man, we don't got the money. We don't got the money. Or you're like Andrew, hey, this is all we got. This is all we got. Little in the hands of Jesus is much. He provides every need of life. God will never command you to do something that you cannot do. You can do this. Care and share like Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and your grace. We do thank you that you cared enough for a lost soul like me to give us the word, to give us hope. Thank you, Lord, that we have the ability, the resources, the health and the wealth in the heart to care and a heart to share. Bless your word to your people. Put into their minds somebody who they can be a blessing to, whether it be a single mom next door, a blended or a mixed family struggling down the block, a neighbor, a cashier, a relative. Help us to extend a caring hand and a sharing hand like Jesus. For we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Um, At this time, we have an occasion to rejoice.